Welcome to the Agency Journey Podcast, where we connect with agency leaders to uncover the hidden systems and processes that drive their success. Now, let's dive into today's show. All right, welcome back to Agency Journey. This is Gray McKenzie, and this week I've got the pleasure of bringing on Dean Dutrail from Worth Ecommerce, uh, recently acquired by Smartbug. But we'll get into that whole story. Dean's developed podcaster, so this will be a fun conversation. Dean, welcome to the podcast, man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Um, I'm excited. Um, we've only gotten a chance to know each other here over the last year and a half or whatever it's been. But um, but your agency story obviously goes back farther than that. I think, and I'll let you kind of figure out where you want to go, but you'd run an agency prior to Worth Ecommerce, right? You and Ryan were both running independent things and then joined forces. Yeah. So the actual like even further back story is that uh, I was working at this company uh, called Aerotech and I was doing like aviation sales hmm. and I was kind of selling like to Boeing and like these large aviation companies and traveling all over the Northwest. And um, it was a blast. And Ryan was working as a digital nomad doing UX design and had started a, a uh, UX design agency. And he came and stayed with me for a month. And at the, like the last day that he was there, he, he like asked me if I wanted to go into business with him. And, uh, and, uh, cause he needed someone to help with sales, right? Like he was doing all the UX work and he was at a point where he just couldn't sell anymore, but he still wanted to grow. So he was super nervous to ask me cause I, I, I loved my job. It was a sick place yeah. to be. You know, I was like 24, 25 and, um, and it was, it was hard to say it, it was hard to leave, but I knew I wanted to do it and I knew I wanted to, to start something and, and join him. And so him and I actually uh started at Gobi Savvy and we our goal was to travel the world, um, work with cool companies, meet cool people, make a ton of money, like live at the beach. And like, you know, we we did that. We went to Asia, uh, we went to Europe, we went to Australia, we traveled all over and we did everything except for the make money part. <laughs> and uh, you know, about a year in, we just kind of realized like this isn't working. And whatever we were doing just it wasn't generating income, right? We ended up going into debt and both of us moved back to the States and lived with our grand grandparents. Uh, so like at like 26, I was like living in my grandparents' house, you yeah. know, kind of like, what the heck do I do next? And what had happened is he had gotten into e-commerce and really enjoyed doing e-commerce work. So he started an e-commerce company, still did some UX work on the side. And we had a client, uh, their, their name is uh, Koala Mattresses which is this like the Casper of Australia at the time. Hmm. And they asked us if we, if we did email marketing, cause we were doing some UX and CRO work on their site. And uh, I was like, yeah, uh, we, we do it. I'd never done it before, you know, and we charged them $900, which is a ridiculously cheap amount for what we provided. But I took a week and I learned everything about, uh, and what, what worth does is we're an email and SMS marketing company for e-commerce companies. This is kind of the origin story, but uh, you know, I learned everything I could about copywriting, design, email marketing, picked a software, and just went for it. And the first automations or flows we set up for these guys within weeks were generating like 15, 20 grand a month. I was like, I think we could sell this. And uh, so I started instant email copy. And Ryan would send me clients to fulfill email work on. And I'd also helped his company's e-commerce company and just over over time grew it. And uh, grew it in, in the Portland, Oregon area. And I changed my mindset from like kind of being a, a consumer business where like I was just going to these places to explore and, and not really give back to an idea of like, how could I create a community? How could I create something where the core value is growth for ourselves and for our clients? And that is still a core value of worth as we go. Um, and while I was growing into an email copy, Ryan was, was doing his e-commerce business. He had some success and he started competing with me and doing email marketing. I was like, I was like, what the hell, man? <laughs> and, uh, but it was, you know, there's so many clients. It was like, neither of us could fulfill on, on the amount of clients that were coming in. And finally we met up in California for a week and we were like, well, I'm just join forces, take what, you know, take what I know, combine our teams and, we decided to do it. We spent two weeks in Bend, Oregon, which is my hometown, and came up with Worth e Commerce. 
We create a list of values that we wanted to live by and hire people by and types of clients we wanted to work with, created a mission. And that was a big turning point for us. Like having values and a mission, I think attracted so many more people to join our team that I, I really believe that was a, a huge part of our growth. Yep. That's an awesome story. What's the timeline there? And I had no idea um, that you were in aviation sales. Right? Yeah. So, uh, part of all that. The, what, an, what a cool story. Um, you guys started worth when you joined forces. When was that? 2019, 2018? September of 2019. Okay. So two years ago, actually. Yeah. That's crazy. Where were the two businesses at the time? Um, like in, in terms of headcount or you know, like basically headcount, client count, whatever is the easier metric to. Yeah. Instant email copy. I think we had 10 employees. Okay. Um, and it was like a hybrid of some employees, some contractors. Uh, he was still running Gobi Savvy and I think he had five or six. Okay. So maybe like 15 total people headcount wise. Well, and that that's so then when you got, you guys just sold um, a couple months ago uh, yep. earlier here in 2021. So in under two years, you go from that to what was head count when you uh, were acquired? I think we're at 45 when we were acquired. We tripled in two years, which is crazy to, to have that kind of growth. Obviously, you're buoyed by a couple of different things. One, the market. I mean, here we go for quarter number five of the best agency growth in the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, consecutively, which is crazy. But that wasn't the story for the whole first half of your journey. And obviously COVID, we had no idea when COVID started, that it was going to turn out. Yeah. this beneficial for the specific segment that we're in. Um, and you guys are also buoyed by your in e-com, which is doing super well. And your Clavio has paid off that bet that you guys made to go in with them yep. in a big time way too. But, but still, there's a lot of folks who are swimming in that pond who aren't growing um, that quickly. So it's a long way of saying that's what I want to understand. That's what I'll unpack and share. It's like, what did you guys get right? And what should agencies take away from that in terms of how you scaled so quickly? Yeah. And, you know, pretty perspective, like we're at a new level and where we are now is like, I'm having to relearn everything. Right. And it's that kind of old philosophy of like what worked for us now isn't working for us. And so we've, since being acquired, we were acquired by a larger agency. Um, there's different challenges. Um, but to go from 15 to 50, you know, it was pretty quick. And, you know, I think there's two parts to it. One is we had experience prior in the industry, right? It wasn't like we just started something and, and, and then caught this wave of, of e-commerce boom and COVID and people working from home and all of that. It was, it was, you know, we actually had prepped for it, right? So we were ready for the opportunity in, in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it just became a matter of, I, I, would, I would literally just write down on paper, I would, I would create an org chart, right? And I would, I would sketch it out and say, okay, if we gain, you know, 10 more clients, what does our company look like? If we gain 20 more, what does it look like? And how can we kind of scale that way? So it was almost like, uh, like I, I have like all these old sketches of org charts, right? Of like what it would look like. Um, and, but we always led with the core values, right? Always led with the growth and the mission. And, you know, we, we had to have different systems in place. So the, the other thing is I, I got mentorship, right? So I joined the Jason Swick Agency Mastermind and connected with people to put systems in place that allowed us to scale to where we are, including hiring systems, which is super important. Um, now, I'm lucky because I'm a former recruiter, right? So my first job doing aviation sales, before I was promoted there, I was recruiting. And I would you know, interview thousands of people for years, um, every, every year to get them into jobs. So I knew how to set up a recruiting pipeline and a lot of people don't think about that, right? They think about the sales pipeline, which right. is very important, but you need an equal and in, in strong recruiting pipeline. Because if you optimize sales, you need to have people to fulfill on the work. Um, we had this hybrid model of having employees and having contractors and whatnot. I now only do pretty much employees um, because the model works better at scale, right? And then contractors add up in costs over time and you start double paying for like, you know, people doing different types of work, but ultimately it came down to like being ready and then having a mentor and then charting out what growth could look like. 
um, and tying that to our values. I think that was super important. That's helpful. I have a couple of specific questions off of that. One of the things that's impressed me or that I can take away looking at the outside from what you guys have done is that you have invested. We've got a lot of ties together. Um, you're on a podcast. We're both working with Jeremy Wise and the guys at Rise 25. Um, connected with Joey Gilkey and Sales Driven Agency. Um, Todd Tasky, who's been on the podcast recently from a um, acquisition perspective. Like there's all these. You mentioned Jason. Um, yep. You guys have been, you kind of brought, you were prepared and ready to go, which you mentioned. This isn't like a, it's a two year story for worthy commerce, but it's a six or seven year story or whatever it is for the actual yep. you know, kind of road here. Um, so that piece has impressed me. And I guess that's my first question is where did that, I assume that's intentional, but sometimes this stuff's not intentional. It's just like, Hey, that's the way that we know to go. But a lot of agency owners are super hesitant uh, to invest in getting outside help. Is that something that you and Ryan have always been in lockstep on? Is that something that one of you pushes more than the other? What what drives that decision to get outside help? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you go back to our core values is growth, right? So for me, like I, I, I love to read. I love to learn. I love to hear people talk. I love all that kind of stuff. And I find it super helpful. Um, to put in perspective, like from an ROI standpoint, like the Jason Swank mastermind was great because there were other agencies in there. And a lot of those agencies became referral partners, right? So maybe I'm paying, you know, X amount per month and spending, you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars a year on mentorship. But from that mentorship and that group of people, you know, we probably closed ten clients, which is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Um, we got a podcast started, which is also probably worth, you know, equal amounts. It's so like, a, you know, a twenty thousand dollar investment has turned into a ten x, twenty x return because of the relationships that were were built, uh, the systems that we were able to put in place, referrals that we got, marketing that we got, like that is the best ROI I've ever seen. You know, um, may maybe Bitcoin could beat it, uh, you know, if you invested two years ago, but that was my biggest investment was, um, was going down that road. And then you talk about Joey, Joey Gilkey building out a sales system for us. That was a, that was a major, major investment. Um, I won't say how much, but it was, you know, right. basically, basically near six figures. And that has generated millions of dollars of revenue in that system. Um, and so, you know, when you make these, but I've also made decisions that didn't pan out, right? Sure. Like I've hired lead gen agencies that, you know, we paid and they still haven't delivered. It's been like a year. Yeah. Um, you know, we've paid marketing agencies. So we've made mistakes, but when they pay out, they pay out large. So it right. seems like. Right. When did uh, this also kind of surprised me because uh, when we got a chance to work with you guys and um, got in touch, I didn't uh, mention you guys either. Apologies. Well, we were, we're in that failed bucket. Click up, failed click up consultants in the in the, no, uh, no, we we use click up uh, on the regular, but but uh, Ryan was leading growth, but you're actually the one who comes from the sales background. Yeah. So did you guys? How did you guys get to that point? Did you flip flop roles? Yeah, actually, that's really interesting. So. When I, I'm good at uh, enterprise sales, right? And that takes time and energy in a completely different system, right? And the sales cycles, you know, back when I was selling enterprise could be six months to two years, right? right? The sales cycle in, in our space is like 20 to 30 days. And I wasn't as good at that as I was with the other types of sales. Like I, I like taking you know a prospect or a client to a dinner and flying out to see them and that kind of stuff that doesn't work in in this space so Ryan Ryan actually moved into the sales marketing and he's he's essentially like the VP of growth I moved into more of the CEO operations and getting the team aligned because it, it turns out I'm I'm really good at recruiting right and he's really good at connecting with a lot of these business owners. So we, to you're totally right, and that's a that's a great catch. Like we completely flip flopped once we knew, like our actual skill sets and, and what we like doing. Um, yeah, that's that's really um, it's interesting to see people, and then from that, like hear that story that you come from the sales background. I could definitely see that. Not that uh, Ryan's not a relationship builder as well, but there's different types of relationship builders. Some people like the new and uh kind of like constantly new and there's other people who are boring like me who's uh like i like having long-term relationships and going deep with people and like the meeting 100 people at a party and having two minutes of conversation is not 
that's not uh, very invigorating for me. It's just kind of draining, but I'd yeah. love to talk to a smaller group of people and know them over a period of time. Um, and that obviously is really effective in long-term like restaurant and sales and yeah. it's harder to do if you're in a very transactional relationship. Yeah. And the other thing that I realized too, is like there's salespeople that are, are better than me as, as the owner. Right. Yeah. And a prime example is, you know, this month, actually, like my salespeople, we've got four salespeople and they're selling a product that I used to sell for $1,500 for like 12 grand. Yeah. And it's literally, the, it's the same thing. Right. Um, now we're much better at what we do because we've, we've grown a lot, but it's essentially the same deliverables. Um, and, and I would, I don't think I would have ever, ever been able to sell it for that. You know, right. my skills aren't there. Um, I helped create the scope and operationally how to deliver and strategy, but they went out and sold it. And that was right. like, w- when they did that, I was like, this is like, I should have hired salespeople five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's fast forward then to the decision to sell. I assume you and Ryan, I mean, what, just back to the, even being open to it. And I don't actually know the backstory yet, which I'm excited to have this conversation. I don't know who reached out to who first, whether Todd was engaged by Ryan to start hunting and found you guys or how that connection originally got made. But was that you and Ryan had already talked about, Hey, we're open to, um, to, you know, selling off and hopefully having a, a second bite down the road or how did that evolve? Yeah. So Ryan and I, again, going, like going back to growth, like most of our decisions are based off that, that value is like, how can we get to the next level? Um, we, there's a co- so there's a couple items in there. One, I wanted to learn about the mergers and acquisition market, right? So I wanted to learn what it was all about. Cause I kept hearing these stories of, you know, a competitor of mine got sold and like another person. I was like, what's like, what is this like? How do you actually do that? I thought it'd be really cool to learn. So I reached out to Todd, who was a referral from Jason. And he was like, Hey man, you guys are probably too early, but like, we can just see what's out there and see who's interested. And that was like a, a year long process. Right. And so we engaged pretty early with the idea of like, if we wanted to sell out the opportunity, would we have everything in place to be able to do so? And if not, then at least I get to learn how successful companies operate from a financial perspective, right. From a legal perspective and like put themselves in a position to either grow or be purchased. Um, so my mindset was like, either way, I'm going to either learn how to scale or, or be acquired. Um, and we talked with various companies. They weren't a good fit. Either we were too small. They, they were too enterprise. They weren't in the same marketplace, et cetera. And then we met Smartbug and instantly like hit it off. There was like a connection. Um, their senior team had a lot more experience than my team. Um, and for me, like I was ready to get to a new place in my own career, you know, like I've, I've got a mastermind and mentors, but I was looking for like, what's next personally, like professionally, how do I go from 50 people to, you know, 500 people. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't have a clear path of how to do that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I feel like the smart bug team has a pretty clear path of how to do it and has experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm realistic, like I'm 31, I sold when I was 30. Mm-hmm. So to me, it was just like a career move in some ways. And it also worked out because we're a sister company, right? So we got to keep the name and how Smartbug grew was very similar. So they they went through HubSpot and we're going through Klaviyo. They do B2B, we do B2C, right? So the model is this is almost the same. It's just a different market. And uh, so we're learning a lot from them. That's, that's what I wanted. And I wanted also to provide opportunities for my team uh, where we just specialize in in two things, basically, to be able to have opportunities to cross pollinate skill sets, um, because we want to, you know, potentially expand services, et cetera. But um, that was sort of the thinking behind that. I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, that's helpful. And Ryan, it's been a couple of years since we had him on the podcast, but um, and I should only say positive people, uh, positive things about people on this podcast. But Ryan has an interesting, I have a ton of respect for Ryan. Which, kind of, which Ryan? Uh, Ryan Malone. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, CEO at, at Smartbug um, or, or the founder of Smartbug originally. Um, yeah. I shouldn't, shouldn't say Ryan. Okay. Ryan, um, he has a kind of distinct view on the market. He does it. He's not a uh, kind of someone who's just following the beaten path entirely. He's got his own, he's got strongly held convictions about how to build an agency, which I have a ton of respect for. 
And um, he also, when he feels like he has some secret sauce, some of that leaks back out into the world and some of that he keeps close to the vest. And I've run into folks who don't appreciate that about him, which totally, totally fair. And I actually think it's kind of baller of him. Um, so I've always had a lot of respect for Ryan and the way that he's built stuff and been real intentional about structuring a remote team before that was the cool thing and the normal thing to do. And yeah, I, that was another piece was I love that they had intentionally built it that way. And we were, uh, uh, we built that way at first, and then I kind of went hybrid and now we're going fully back to that. And, uh, yeah, to, to build a culture like like they have remotely is is very tough, and uh, so I'm excited to keep keep learning from them. What? But I guess from the outside looking at that, what is the like? What's the big one plus one makes three? Go back to the pre HubSpot, but HubSpot tried to co opt that that phrase for a while because you guys, I mean, very similar models. Like they've been in the HubSpot ecosystem. Uh, we were in the HubSpot ecosystem with them for a while. Um, you guys are in the Clavio ecosystem, but you're talking about you guys are B2C, they're B2B. What's the um, overlap there? Like, are you guys pulling Clavio into smart bug clients? And how many of those clients does that make sense? Um, how does that, how do those add up with different audiences and different service types? Obviously, different service types make a lot of sense, but often see those go together with similar audiences and we're layering on more email marketing for this. So, how do, how do you guys? What is, what is that value prop in the alignment there? Um, it's a good question. We're, we're fleshing out some of it. They, they recognize that they needed to be in the e-commerce space, right? And so they saw this as an opportunity to take what they knew, apply it to another agency, and leverage it to grow faster. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, there's like, like they, they were turning away e-commerce leads because they didn't have someone to fulfill on it. And we often turn away B2B leads because we don't have the expertise. So there's there's some sort of crossover. Uh, but the other key piece is Clavio is going more enterprise in a lot of ways. So they see that coming down the pipeline. And what's interesting is that a lot of people from HubSpot left and have gone to Clavio. Right. Right. So there's this there's a ton of overlap in in many different ways. Um, in terms of like, Hey, like we, we run a Facebook ad agency, you guys do email and SMS let's refer. It's not that distinct. Um, it's more like, Hey, we know this model works and let's take these guys who have the same model and boost them up in a market that's rising. Right. Um, and and I think everyone knows e-commerce is, is blowing up and has been since 2015, but really started taking off like, you know, during COVID. Um, and I, I still think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's now, it's now just getting easy to, to sell stuff online, <laughs> you know, like this year, it's much easier than it ever has been. But, uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, well, I think that's helpful in terms of, Hey, here's some of the easier ways to value. Obviously, I mean, you see value in some of these deals where you know, we get to pair up the back, the back end operations. There's some value created there, which I don't know. How much you guys may not have integrated that many things on the back end at this point. Have you done a lot of kind of pulling together hiring or stuff, or does that say separate because it's a sister brand? Yeah, uh, I mean, we've done some minor stuff, like like some HR stuff, some accounting stuff, yep. which which is nice because it kind of takes the pressure off. Like like I was in the books all the time trying to figure out our accounting, and now there's a CFO that we get to kind of lean on, which is super helpful. Um, it was it was a pain at first because I had. Uh, reorganize, you know, our, our entire books and collect every invoice for like two years, um, to, to get it over. But once that's done, it's done. Um, and I think I, I know recruiting wise, there'll be some integrations, um, because our, our HR guy is a solid recruiter and, you know, you might as well lower costs and find good talent in different ways. Um, sales, like we're learning different sales strategies from them to sell enterprise, learning how to roll out new services better. Right. So like mm. their full service, how do they go about it? How do they test right. it? Things like that. So um there's so so just minor integrations, but add up over time, you know. Right. right right now, hiring is the biggest problem companies face. So having two companies targeting different different types of of skills, but like great people is really helpful. Um yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that what was the uh going through that process? I mean, there's all kinds of things that 
people going through an acquisition seem to struggle with, whether it's on the front end of the deal with all the due diligence and learning that there's in or out or like figuring out how uh, deals get structured from a comp perspective. And then on the back end, dealing with true ups and you know, like who gets owned, what revenue and all that kind of stuff. Is there one piece of that you mentioned kind of the digging back through invoices? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, due diligence sucks. Like it's not <laughs> fun at, at all. And we, we were lucky that we were relatively organized, but it wasn't like no one's ready for it. I don't, right. I don't think I've ever heard anyone be like, yeah, I was totally ready. Like, <laughs> like, no, you weren't. Uh, I'm sure a large, much larger companies probably have some things dialed in. Um, and, you know, during the deal, even up to like the last week, I didn't know if it was going to go through mm. because everyone had deal fatigue, right? right? Everyone was sick and tired of looking at the numbers, looking at these contracts, looking at invoices, looking at like everyone was sick of it, you know? Yeah. And uh, I remember talking to my girlfriend. I was like, I don't know if this is going to go through. Like, and it was like the Friday before signing and they got pushed a week. And I was like, yep, probably not going to go through. And uh, so that was super stressful. And I, and I feel like I took my eye off the ball for a few months. Right. Like I could tell the business suffered a little bit. And then um, post sale, it was kind of that like, like, like post grad blues or post vacation blues. Like, you're just kind of, did I make the right decision? I was, I was amped up, but also like, and there's a lot that's, that could change. Um, one thing going from cash accounting to gap accounting. Right. Mm. And you, you know, you're talking about true ups and stuff. So there's, you know, revenue that I thought would go into our pockets that actually went to the company because of the way gap accounting works. You have revenue isn't counted until the work is fulfilled. Right. And so all that gets pushed. So you actually end up sometimes having to write a check to the company that purchased you. Uh, right. for that weird period of revenue. Um, so that stuff, but I was advised, Todd kind of told me like, Hey, this is a possibility. This could happen. You're on cash accounting. When you move to gap, things can change. And, uh, but it, it all will hopefully equal out. Uh, there's, there's like little things like, uh, we weren't like truing up PTO in our P and L. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when you get acquired, you typically will figure out a, a percentage and you have to pay that out. Right. Um, so that, that wasn't expecting that kind of stuff. So there's like these little things that kind of like ding you, but yeah. keeping your eye on the bigger picture is what's, what's important. That's a good way of putting it. There's enough of that stuff that it starts to get really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, I feel like at least in the folks who I've seen go through this process and the friends who I've seen kind of run through that, uh, it can be easy. I, I, everybody takes their eye off the ball. I don't think I've talked to anybody who has not. Yeah. Felt like, hey, the company definitely suffered. And also, I think for a lot of people, there's stress associated with, I have this huge, exciting news that I'm excited about, and I can't share this with yeah. all kinds of Like living a double life. A lot to me. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's, I mean, you probably have to be a psychopath for that, not to take a, a toll on you <laughs> to some yeah. degree. Um, but, and then the other thing I would say, like, if people do get acquired, I think at least this happened for us, like, we were all going ho about like, we're going to change stuff up. Like we're going to change our processes, our systems. We're going to make it better. And uh, we had this whole spreadsheet of stuff and action items. It was too much, right? Like you don't right. realize how hard it is to change a system, you know? And so we, we finally had to like have a conversation and say, Hey, like we need to go back to our core focus and competency because all this other stuff, it's, it's not moving the needle forward and it's, right. it's too much at once. So I would like, if you get acquired, everyone's going to want to improve things, fix things like 2080 it, you know? Right. Um, right. And, and I made that mistake of not holding to that kind of philosophy, which is something I hold dear. And, uh, but you know, now we're, now we're in a good place, I think. Right. That makes sense. Well, so a couple of things here then as we're on the, on the tail end of the acquisition, you guys have made it through, you're a smart bug company now, um, still running worthy commerce in terms of vision the stuff that you're looking forward to and excited about right now, obviously you mentioned hiring. Everyone's is struggling to hire. What are the hardest roles or what are the kind of current roles that you guys are looking to fill? Um, just, just looking for good marketers in this space. You know, I think we, we, during COVID, for example, we hired a lot of green people and we had to basically train from scratch. Um, which is good and bad. It's, it's good in the sense that they develop skills and you can hire cheaper and faster. It's bad in the sense that they can get poached sometimes. 
Right. And you become like the training ground for other agencies, yep. um, which is not a good thing either. Um, but, you know, I think that we, for, for people who are hiring, if you can hire remote, you're going to get a lot more applicants, right? Like, to, to be honest, we, our trouble is we get too many applicants and sifting through it, right? Yep. We'll get 100, 200 applicants and because it's remote and we pay well and, you know, we lead with our vision and values. Um we, we don't even talk about the job until later on in the post, right? We talk about the company, the culture, the values, and that attracts a lot more people, I think. Right. Um, but, you know, we're always looking for great marketers. And I, I try to tell my team, like, you're not a copywriter, like, you're a marketer. You're not a designer, you're a marketer. Um, and you just have this other skill set in some ways. And some people like that, some people don't. But yep. that makes sense. Do you, I've got a couple other quick hitters here. You guys see much seasonality? I know you're a retainer driven business. Yeah. I would imagine. I mean, you go to Worthy Commerce right now and there's a countdown timer at the top, which is really smart. Countdown to Black Friday. Are you ready? Yeah. Um, I would assume, I mean, like we have this all the time. Q4 is our biggest quarter because everyone, like, I've been fighting this struggle all year long. I'm not going to go into next year with the same thing. It's going to take me two or three months to fix this. I'll go work with Zenpilot and stream on our ops. Um, do you guys see the same thing? Is it run up to holidays? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. So because we're, uh, uh, vertical in e-commerce, we serve different industries within e-commerce. Mm. So different industries are seasonal, right? Yeah, that makes um, sense. so a lot of people experience like Q1 seasonality in various companies. We don't because we have a lot of nutrition companies, mm. right? And everybody's buying nutrition products, right? You know what I mean? Um, what we do see a boost in is just upsell revenue. Right. So, uh, we'll still get the same number of clients. We, we, on average close about the same amount of clients throughout the year, which is really nice. Um, and then just during Q4, that's when we're like, Hey clients, like you need to implement this, you need this, you need this. Um, it's going to cost this and here's, you know, your potential ROI. So we see a lot more upsell revenue and we'll stop taking clients at some point so we can deliver. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like an influx of new clients. Again, it's just an, an influx of scope that we need to, oh, yep. to sell. That makes sense. Yeah. And the one other thing I wanted to mention is you've been running the Relationship Commerce podcast for a while now. And yep. you mentioned, you tied that back to Jason, which I wasn't familiar with. So how did the podcast come about and what's that experience been like? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Rise25. Um, we we work with them too. Jeremy and, and John are awesome. And it, it came about because we were trying to find new ways to market, to, to get leads and to find prospects. And um, I love talking to people and, and hearing people's stories and whatnot. So um, I think we're almost at a hundred episodes, which is, wow. which is awesome. And I, I like longer form, I like 45 minutes to an hour. And sometimes people come on the show and, and, and they turn into clients. Sometimes they've turned into repeat guests. There's always a connection you can make. Um, so it's been a great ROI. And then I just always feel like I learned something new, right? Like it's like every e-commerce business person or software has like a little something, a little, like you mentioned before, like a secret sauce. And oftentimes they'll, they'll give you a little bit of it. And then we can take that and, you know, use that for our other clients, right? It's so like, we're in that position of learning and knowledge at scale, um, to help our clients grow uh, even faster, which is cool. I don't, I don't know at what point I discovered the podcast. But it was close to when you had um, I'm blanking on his last name, Randall from Dugout Mugs. Um, oh yeah, and I'm a huge baseball nerd, um, so I was like, oh, this is this is perfect. But anyways, it's awesome to see you uh, podcasting using that tool, and uh, it is I mean it's an awesome relationship builder and a great opportunity. To, I think you mentioned personal development. It's obviously something or professional development. That's a big priority to you. There's no better way than podcasting and getting to find inter interesting folks and kind of dig through their story. And, yeah. Uh, and people are willing to share a lot. So that's an awesome tool. Yeah. And, and I like, I like personally finding like, like what I call like the hidden entrepreneurs, like the people out there that maybe aren't on Forbes, maybe aren't on like Inc. 5000, but they're still, you know, have 10, 20, 30, 40 employees and they're growing a business, you know. And it's more real conversations. Some of the ones I've had where they're like larger businesses, it's like always a script. It's like always yeah. the same. Like I've had some like pretty large companies and I just like stopped because I was like, it's like, I've heard this on five other podcasts. Right. <laughs> but, that's, 
I, I feel like there's a mix there of some people who give a, who do a ton of speaking authors are usually like yes. pretty good on, on podcasts because they had to think about this stuff and, and deal with it. And like Seth Godin for all the speak, all the talks he's done, he'll always be interesting to me, but you're right. 80% of the same, same 80, 20 rule, like 80% of the time you're going to get the same story that you've heard everywhere else. And so, yeah, I think there's an element there of, I take pride in kind of finding the people who aren't featured on agency podcasts. I'm like, yeah. hey, how can we, you're an exception because you, you are on a bunch of different podcasts. Uh, but how can we find the people who aren't out there and dig into that story? And sometimes it's hit and miss. Sometimes those people have great stories, but it's not told in a super interesting way. And that's, that's fine too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to make sure I give you guys a shout out too, because you guys help build our operating system, like basically from scratch. And, and we use ClickUp every day. We use it for, for everything. We're building scopes and time tracking. And that was phenomenal. That was a phenomenal investment. Um, and, you know, basically any new person that comes in can go into the system that you guys help built and it's step by step. They know what to do Now they don't always follow it, right? Like <laughs> not everyone always follows the system, but at least it's there and people can find it. And it's been a training tool, a project management tool, time tracking tool, uh, ideas tool to use for our social media stuff or podcast stuff. It's, it's, you guys did tremendous work there. So I want to give you a shout out. I appreciate it. And a lot of the credit for that project, I mean, we consistently see this. Uh, we've got a system. PM and ops is such a core function that a lot of that um, knowledge has to get centralized in-house at some point in time. So it makes a ton of sense to work with somebody from the outside who's done this a ton of times to come in and build it initially. But someone's got to run it. And uh, Derek, RV, yeah. leading it on your end. Um, but kind of your whole leadership team diving in and jumping through the good and the bad and the, like just just running through it all um there's a big difference in how quickly agencies benefit from it when there's that rock star internally yeah versus kind of they don't have the same infrastructure and and a lot of times it's not necessarily that the person who's leading it internally isn't talented but they're also not enabled or empowered by the leadership team to make a lot of decisions that they need to make to move things forward so you guys kind of top to bottom did a really nice job through that project uh, an implementation. So, and it's been cool to see you continue to grow and scale um, using ClickUp and, and continue to, uh, to improve. Dean, this has been super fun. Um, I appreciate you coming on and being willing to share. WorthEcommerce.com is the website. Uh, we mentioned SmartBug in the podcast. Is there anywhere else we should point people to follow you or connect with you? Uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Dean Dutro. Uh, if you search for me and, and uh, I get a lot of interesting stories on there and, and there's a lot of cool people to connect with there but that's that's where i'm most active awesome well i appreciate you being willing to come on be so generous with uh with what you know what you've learned thanks for your time dean yeah appreciate it thanks for listening to the agency journey podcast visit agencyjourneyinsiders.com to join the podcast community and be sure to subscribe for future episodes